Well, thank you, Hiji, for the long introduction, which I really need that to get the system to work. So it's my first time in Brazil, and uh, really gracious the host. I'm really, um, you know, enjoy every minute of it. And uh, you will know why I'm going to show you before I even start my talk. And uh, the first day of here is a big party. And uh, I'm sure now you uh, can learn not just about photonics, but also the wild side of <laughs> Professor Tuchin. And the poise and the position of Professor Yu. <laughs> and some real talent from among the students. <laughs> I'm not disappointing when you know, I come to Brazil. This is what I'm expecting. But obviously, there is a gangster's reunion here, which is really it gave me a smile. And the best host I ever had. And of course, the party is not going to be done without a photonic beer. I'm sure everyone has a, a load of it. And in the end, wow. I mean, what can I say? <laughs> That's why I call the perfect first day in Brazil. <laughs> so on that note, I'm going to start my lecture. Uh, really, I'm going to cover the broad sense of cancer nanomedicine, particularly in biophotonic <coughs> nanomedicine. And I want to use this first lecture, really cover what's the advantage, the pro and the con of nano. And I'm talking about really focus my talk on addressing the translation hurdles in the three areas. The purpose of this talk is not to scare you from pursuing the nano in, the, in your career, but rather put you in the context to actually to think very carefully how you actually, before you actually set foot in the nano, or you're in the nano, think a little bit broadly what you need to do to get a nano to be successful. So I think there is a lot of lesson in the broad nano community has learned, and I think that will be beneficial. We actually learn our lesson as well, very hard lessons. So hopefully that sharing this will be helping. And uh, so what's nano? Everyone has their favorite um, definition of nano. My favorite is this one, because if you're looking at nano only at the size, the DNA, the virus, it's all nano. But the key here is word intentional. If you put it intentional, if you actually manipulate a nano-sized device or nano-sized you know, particle, now I would say that's a true definition of nano. So why nano is important? Well, number one, the nano means size, right? So anywhere between the virus and the glucose, and all these about from one conventionally defined one to 100 nanometers nano size, plus the intentional design. But the key for nano, I would argue, is in the three different areas. One is the material property, the nanoscale material property. And the multifunctional is the hallmark of nanomedicine. And that is one thing I want to talk about. Physical property. The nano brings so much physical property associated with nano scales. It could be photonics, could be magnetic, could be you know melting point, many different kinds of things. There is also biologically, it's also important for nano. And that is one of the probably most important effects everybody's claiming ubiquitously for the nano is the EPI effect, enhanced memory retention. So first, multifunctional. The hallmark of nano is multifunctional, right? Because nano brings you so much a platform to bring so much things together. You could have different drug delivery. You can actually not only change the pharmacokinetic of the drug, you can actually put in different drug in different mechanism, put them all together, right? You can also include in the contrast agent. Using nano for a contrast agent, for imaging, you can combine them together. Essentially, all these areas you can have imaging guide drug delivery. You instruct the patient using imaging to find which kind of population is great for uh, cancer treatment. That's, you know, is actually a very useful area. You also have imaging identify what's the optical window, what's the therapeutic window for the treatment. In the PDT field, we're using the nano, for example, to define the treatment, like a treatment planning, pre-treatment planning. You can also have imaging of all these imaging guided surgery, Essentially, 
This is what nano is, what's the defined that nano's a true advantage. The second advantage, now this is actually um, pretty exciting, this, uh, basically, news in the two, about now, one year and a half ago, the grouping basic cancer agency in Vancouver by the Marcel Bailey's group has successfully got the first FDA approval of the true, what I would argue, the first true demonstration of nano effect. So if you have looked at Doxo, which is Doxolubicin liposome formulation, is known for 30, 40 years. And that is if people argue it's not nano, before nano even named, because is in a way they can say it's a recipient, it's a making the drug stay in the, the blood circulation longer, that change the pharmacokinetics. But what nano can do is you can do the drug combination. If you have two different mechanisms of the drug, imagine, each of them working a different kind of way, the different separacellular organelles. So how can you make sure these two drugs give inject systematically can work coordination when they are reaching the tumor site? You can't, right? So this is the example of that. But if you're doing the nano, imagine you can fix a ratio. And this ratio can be maintained to a certain extent when they're reaching the tumor site. Now you can truly achieve a synergistic effect. And this is what this drug is approved for. One to five ratio, they approve by the, they improve the survival for the AML treatment. And that is arguably, I will argue, this is one of the very first example of the true nano effect of the multifunctional has been approved. Now if you look at this, there's so many papers out there. Everybody's copycatting, trying to make the drug combination works. It's very hard to do. The second is obviously, is very familiar to this audience, is the nanoscale properties. Once you're reaching the nanoscale, everything miracle happen, right? This is the famous cup, I'm sure you all know, in the British Museum. And if you turn, don't turn on the light, you have this color. If you turn on the light, you have this color, right? The absorption of light changed. So it is really because of the surface plasma effect. It's a localized surface plasma. Is when you have this size and shape dependent, and you actually, the absorption of the, in the gold surface corresponding to oscillation. I mean, this, uh, the surface plasma oscillation. And that's why you have the different color at different size. But one thing people actually kind of neglected is when you have the size going this way, going further, further, further down, when you drop below three nanometers, and some papers argue is 2.2 nanometer as a critical size, then you turn to the quantum confinement effect. Now you become go nanoparticle, become luminescent, become fluorescent. So that's actually a very interesting way to demonstrate when you have the nano size, when you change a different size and shape, the property, optophotonic property can change. So the bio effect, which I want uh, for talking about the EPI effect, this will be my main have emphasis on the lecture three. Essentially, is when you have this phenomenon effect, when you have the doxorubicin, for example, you in the liposome structure, they actually circulating in the body for long, long circulation for a long time. Then slowly, because of this uh, lymphatic drainage, poor lymphatic and the leaky vessel, they more and more accumulating the tumor. Eventually, they got accumulation, and that's what people arguing: all the nanoparticles go to the tumor. That's everybody's arguing, and that's actually a big lesson to be learned here. Don't jump on the same. Everybody jump on the same conclusions. So, the reason I want to argue that is there is a literally hundreds of thousands of papers in the nano for the last 20 years. Very, very few approved nanomedicine, especially for cancer, very, very few. If you look at this, abraxin is one of them. That's albumin argumentary. There's also majority of them are lipid-based, liposome-based structures. And why is that? NCI alone, National Cancer Center, National Cancer Institute in the US, spent 10 years has a nano cancer initiative, and that is $4 billion. That's up to 2015 spent. Very, very, very few drugs has been gotten. And that's all the question we need to ask, why? So by photonic nanomedicine, particularly in, in challenges-wise, I would argue these are the three things I'm going to talk about. It. The first lecture is going to focus on the complexity associated with multiplex, multifunctional. The second is about the most biphotonic nanomaterial are inorganic nanoparticles. So how can we chemists, you know, bioengineering do 
to really broaden the purview of biophotonics into the organic field. The third lecture really is going to talk about the dark side of EPR. So multifunctional, as I said, is one of the hallmark of nanoparticle design. If you look at asking every chemist, every biomedical engineering, every pharmacy faculty, they will, everybody doing the nano, everybody will claim they have, a one, they have their own nanoparticle. The nanoparticle can do everything. In a way, it's correct. Because if you're adding each piece of the function together, you can accomplish the multiple function. That's the, by nature, by nature, by definition, that's a nano. That's a Lego concept. We play with Lego all the time. That's how the Lego works. This is probably one of the most extraordinary case. Is in the, at that time, it was uh, 2011, they published a paper called Protocell. <laughs> Essentially what it does is mesopolysical nanoparticle covered by lipid shell with all the decorations. And in this mesopolysical particle, they can be biodegradable, you can have all different drugs, 5 euro so, you know, cis platinum, you know, essentially a name it. Everything they can get in there should, should work. They also put in a different peptide sequence to make sure they get inside cell endocytosis, endocytosis and get out of the endocytosis, they go to cytosol. So perfect example of this you know, all-in-one concept. We are not in exception. My, my work group is also did this. And we did it for the, at this time, I did it in the, when I was in University of Pennsylvania. We did a lot of work on these lipoproteins. Because we did this one, because we realized, in, in fact, this is a picture, a slide I got from the wall post from my family doctor visit. You know, you guys are too young to worry about HDL, LDL. But in my age, I still have to watch out very carefully, HDL, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. But if you look at looking at this function aside, all the lipoproteins are really nice nanoparticles. They are different size nanoparticles. They have a similar common feature, which is a phospholipid monolayer encapsulate the hydrophobic core, which carry different kind of cholesterol, lipid triglyceride, but they also decorate with different proteins. And each protein constrain their size and give their functions. Right? That's what's that. So in our view, this is the perfect nanoparticles. In fact, our group and many other groups has actually worked on many years trying to basically figure out a way to how to decorate this lipoprotein in the different surface, in the core, in the bilayer, try to make them work for almost everything. Right? This is another example of all-in-one <coughs> nanoparticles. Well, the truth of the matter of this we have put major pushback from FDA, from Health Canada, from all the regulated agency. Why? Because FDA, if you talk to them, you have a two component, but they already go in the big headache. It takes them so many years finally approved of two component drug. When you can put a nano with multifunctional, that's like, you know, it's just a red line crossed. Our nano community has to be used to be arguing different way. We used to be arguing, no, the conventional drug should not dictate the nanomedicine because we are different animals, we're different field. But after 10 years argument, we lose. We lost. FDA didn't budge. So that means we still have to make the nanomedicine as safe as a single molecule agent. And that's really the, the, what's the difficult hurdle is. Because when you're talking about all the multifunctional, all the nanoparticle can do, it becomes Achilles heel because there is so much complexity associated with it, you also have difficulty to even scale up the production to a high purity. Probably one of the best examples is dendromer. Many years ago, dendromer used to be the king of nano because it can do so much, and they actually all the way, James Baker Group, all the way made to the clinic to kind of try to make a clinical trial. They actually got $30 million investment to actually beef up the scale up. What happened? During the scale up, 100 grams, they make it 100 grams, they can make 95% purity. When you make one kilo, or two kilo, five kilo, they got 85% purity. That essentially killed the entire dendroma program. Now they actually have to go start from the beginning using click chemistry all the way, try to make the dendroma synthesis scalable. So that's kind of lesson we learned is actually difficult. So we were actually thinking, what if we think an opposite way? What if we think, instead of um, building the multifunctional nanoparticle with different components, what if we start with one component? 
which is multifunctional by themselves. Now, these, if this one can form the nanoparticle by themselves, you give them the nanoscale property in addition to the multifunctional property of the building block. Now you can have a, probably the easier translation pathway. Right? We now learn that is also not easy, but I'm going to show you, but this is our effort. I'm a porphyrin chemist by training, so I, my favorite molecule is porphyrin. I'm sure that in this room, there's a lot of people like porphyrin, because porphyrin is the color of life. You know, you have this, you know, you don't need to tell me to tell you the porphyrin do photosynthesis, give you the oxygen you breathe, the food you eat. Your porphyrin is in your body, which is the hemoglobin, which is carry the oxygen uh, for our functions. But porphyrin is also well known in the photonine therapy. Uh, you also have known as a fluorescence imaging because of this very well known, and there's been more and more truly uh, some pioneer even in the room is trying to pushing this porphyrin into uh, called the clinical trials, clinical applications. So we were thinking a couple of years ago, thought, hey, porphyrin is such a nice metal chelator. You have a magnesium in the chlorophyll, you have the eye in the hemoglobin. Why not we replace that with radioisotope? For example, a copper 64. Now what you want is you transform a photonic material into a nuclear medicine material for PET imaging, for example. So we thought, ha, huh, nice, so we did this, works well, and we tried to file a patent. Then what do we know? We were wrong, because German does it in 1951, and they did it in the science paper, you know. And actually in 1957, there was 27 patients was applied, with, injected with copper 64 porphyrin, hematoporphyrin, and for the purpose of detection tumors. I mean, God, people at that time, people are so smart. But they were ahead of their time because there's no PET scanner, not even invented yet. So that's why people forget about it. And that's why we got lucky because after six, seven years, we actually picked up on this. So this is just to give you an example. The porphyrin is really a nice multifunctional building block. So that's where with our story of the porphyrin nanoparticle come from. But it is not coming from uh, by design. I have to first admit this is truly we stumble on something we serendipitously discovered, and I'm going to explain you how. Essentially, when we are working on the porphyrin, my group is very well known for the academic, academic you know, for the PDT, which is the photonic molecule beacon the field, which still will hold a patent for this. Essentially, when you consider the photonic therapy, the three components, the oxygen, the light, and the porphyrin, you can control how the light is delivered. This is all the beautiful optical fiber technique has been given. All the physics has been done. For example, you can insert the fiber directly to the prostate under the MI guidance. Very precise to do that. So you can control where the light is delivered. This is where the, all the chemists are coming. They find different ways to targeting, making the PDT agent targeted to the tumor to make them selectively go to the porphyrin to the tumor. So that's also selective. Another way is you put them together you have to meet, make the, the you know, oxygen has to be turned on when the sanitizers interact with the light. So that's what the PDT beacon comes from. Without interact with a cancer signature, the agent was silenced. When it's activated by them, by cleave, this protease, for example, will be cleaved, then the agent will be released, now you become, PDT becomes activable. That's the PDT concept. After this, we have the floodgate of every, so many literature directions on how to make an activated PDT in terms of RNA, DNA, in terms of the protease, in terms of the phospholipase, in terms of the carbon tubes. There is many ways to do these activations. So here comes to the nano story. In the 2009, in the summer, it's like it's almost 10 years now, in the summer, my graduate student say, came to me in the, um, in the, I need a side project. I said, okay, a side project, fine. Yeah, as long as you keep a side project, you're okay to do it. So what he wants to do is I want to make a nano beacon. Essentially, you need this crunching concept to make them in a nanoparticle sense. We said, okay, you can do it. Why don't you do with the, you know, uh, Vigodine? Vigodine is already clinical proved. It's a liposome, it's very easy to do. And the Vigodine problem is they only have 1% porphyrin loading. 
When I dig into the pattern of visual dyeing, they claim up to 15%. They never did. So that means about 5%, we put in the 5% porphyrin in the visual dye in the liposome. The liposome falling apart. Because porphyrin is a bulky molecule, they basically tore them apart. So that's the, that's the thing. So the idea is simple. What if we're replacing a fatty acid chain in the regular lipid with a porphyrin? And this porphyrin lipid should be looks like this lipid. That's what the chemistry is. The closer the milk actually like together. So we should have this one titrating this lipid where we have more porphyrin loaded in this way. So that's the idea. Well, the rest is really the history because the more we load it of this porphyrin lipid into the regular lipid, the more stable the nanopod gets, the more quenching you get. The, the, the more stable one is actually quite so striking because after we're loading 100%, that means only this one self-assembled, this one disappears. There's not a single lipid in these molecules. This is where we actually find something very, very exciting. That is, we find this porphyrin lipid molecule can self-assemble into a liposome-like structures. And this structure was a little bit thicker bilayer because you have a porphyrin in berry in a way. And that's the only way to explain that is a hydrophilic pubic porphyrin somehow interact with each other. They become a stabilizing force against the bulky nature for the disruption of the structure. So we got really lucky on that. And that's what we discovered at the porphyrin. So once you form this, then it's starting to get interesting because never before there's a way to put in so much porphyrin in a nanoparticle, let alone in a bilayer. So when you have that, you're counting how many porphyrins times extension coefficient. Then all of a sudden, they are in the gold nanoparticle range. They are the same extension coefficient as the gold nanoparticle. What that means is, they tell you is, whatever the gold nanoparticle can do, we can do it with a single porphyrin molecule self-assembling the structure. Indeed, we show very high photothermal e conversion efficiency. In our case, the, we don't have any fluorescence because everything's quenched. So it's very similar. So that's where we bring our to the first in indication is we want to do the photothermal ablation with that. For that, we gave in the IV of the, basically the porphyrin nanoparticle accumulating the tumor, shine the light. This is infrared image. So that means it's not a fluorescence imaging showing the light. And about 60 seconds, you can see 30 tem degree temperature increase. That lead to complete tumor ablation. So that's actually very, very uh, cool to do it. Another thing, which is obviously, the first thing we think about is, well, thermal effect, photoacoustic, right? Because instead of continuing laser, continue wavelength laser, you heat it, heat it, heat it, why don't you do a pulse laser? Pulse laser take advantage of the same thermal conversion efficacy, but you actually generate only transit temperature increase. The transit temperature increase lead to the thermal expansion and lead to the acoustic wave to be detected by ultrasound. That's the essence of photoacoustic does, is lights in a sound wave out. That solves the problem of the optical because diffuse, you don't worry about the diffuse optics anymore. So that's actually very useful. So once we did that, we show we can link, taking out the lymph structure very clearly, inner lymph node, outer lymph you know, and a lymph vessel, everything was dis, you know, displayed. You may ask why this pre-injection have the image as well. Well, it's just the hemoglobin in the blood because that's a porphyrin as well, so you have endogenous signals. So that actually raised the first question, that is, we are, our particle is made with porphyrin. Porphyrin gets to PDT. So how can you prove the PDT effect is not dominant instead of photothermal? How can you know it's a thermal killing, not the PDT killing? Right? So in order to prove that, it's pretty simple. Because what you need is oxygen. The photothermal is not depending on oxygen. Photodynamic based on oxygen. So if you take the oxygen away from the equation, then you should have pre pretty clear the structure. I mean, you know what's going on. So to do that, we're creating hypoxic model, right? Using this a very, uh, very simple dual model. One side makes them hypoxic, one side keep them the oxygen going. How we did that? We actually play a trick because once you have hypoxic forming, the particle delivery will be different. <laughs> so we give the particle delivery ahead of time. 
make sure they have an evenly distributed tum size matching tumor. They know exactly the same size, they have the same tumor. Now you're actually assuming the nanoparticle go to the equally to these two tumors. Now you put a tunic of the tumor, you're creating acute hypoxic condition confirmed by the HIF-1 and the photoacoustic. Now we actually apply the PDT. So now we know if you, in the photodynamic case, whether you have oxygen or without oxygen, the temperature does not increase. While in the photothermal case, porphyrin case, you have the temperature increase and the both of exactly the same way. And this is important because we keep all the porphyrin dose exactly the same. We keep the light dose exactly the same. The only thing we change is the power. So the one favor photothermal, one favor photodynamic. So this is ultimately the most, most important result. That is, we know the PDT works with the photoframe, but works with only have oxygen tumors. We also know porphyrin indeed works with the photothermal because whether you have oxygen or with oxygen works exactly the same way. But if you're studying the drop the light power, power, you keep the light dose the same, it doesn't work at all. So this basically tells us at least the majority of the cell killing is caused by this photothermal effect. Eventually, the thermal conversion effect of porphyrin was validated. But now the question is, you have a porphyrin monomer versus a porphyrin nanoparticle. One is this, one is this function. And you're not sure in the body how much percentage is intact, how much percentage is a dissociate. So as a chemist in the group, we actually figure out a way to do it. Putting the FRET, introducing a FRET sensor. Now we know is now we're actually introducing the FRET sensor, indicating one is intact structure, one dissociate structure. Now we make dark porphyrin green. Right? So we can actually, this is very similar to the quantum dots first image, inject the porphyrin behind the skin. Now you can see different concentration. You can see this. Ultimately, this gives us sense of the roughly estimate how much percentage of the intact structure after like 24 hours, after 40 hours. So this is how we actually do it. But if you push in the envelope even further, if you find a way to drive this nanoparticle disruption to the completion, now you have a really ultimate or original goal to make a nano beacon, right? Because our idea is to make activatable PDT agent, and this is ultimate activable PDT agent. Because it, how we do that? By introducing the targeting. Because targeting promoting endocytosis and instantly, as good getting the cell, everything broke apart. That's how you're generating the activatable PDT and activable fluorescence imaging. So, as I mentioned, porphyrin can be radio labeled. What we're very lucky to find out, when the porphyrin structure is already made, it can be easily inculating radioisotope like copper 64. And this actually generating tons of interesting applications because for the first time, a nanoparticle doesn't need a chelator to tracking where they are, how much they are, and each, each place. Because our nanoparticle itself are the chelators, right? is a porphyrin the building block is a chelator. So that means really what you see is what you get. So we can now using this way to image, basically follow the happen to what have nanoparticle. Whether they are intact or dissociate, we keep following them until the end, right? So this is, a, for example, this is a PET imaging of the metastasis, bone metastasis model of the prostate cancer. And we can see the bone mats to 1.6 millimeter the identifying can be clearly seen on this image. So the resolution is really limited, not by the porphyrin, by the PET scan in the micro -paths. We know the PET is so sensitive. It's only can imaging, like if you have 0.1% porphyrin loading, we're talking about 100,000 porf 100, porphyrin. If you have 100 porphyrin, there's enough for PET to be scannable. So we didn't fully take advantage of the manual chelation. The one thing we want to do is what if we imagine every single porphyrin has magnet, paramagnet metal, like magnets. Now each of them are MI contrast agent. So that means you times 100,000, there is a lot of MI sensitivity can be addressed. So that's why we show, for example, in this MI scan, we can show the, T, show the lymph neck drainage can be actually observed. And this is important because the, putting the magnets into the porphyrin it does not, it, it limits all the single oxygen, it limits all the fluorescence, but it still has absorption, right? You still can do photothermal, you still can do photoacoustic. The most important, there is no phototoxicity whatsoever. 
So this is what's the principle of the photo of the porphyrol, that is one molecule can do all these functions. But we still can do as a nanoparticle do, we can put in a targeting on it, we can put the drug like doxorubicin loading for active loading, but we are not pushing this for clinical trial in the beginning because once you put a drug in, there are different molecules. So it becomes components, it becomes multiple component. So this is where the essence, and this is how it goes. One for all multifunction is based on the single building block. And this is important because we're not looking for a shortcut in the translation field because after all, our molecule is a new chemical entity, right? And this new chemical entity has to go through very rigorous, as I will show you, rigorous translation process. And, but the key we're looking for is once this process, entire process run its course, now this agent, for all the different applications, you don't need to do, redo all the process, GMP, GLP, and other things. So that's where we think where the, will be the facility, the translation will happen. Not in the beginning, but in the end. So we have now demonstrated the porphyrol's utility and tumor selectivity and in many different kinds of cancer models. We worked in the head, neck, the prostate, lung, pancreas, brain, thyroid, ovarian, endometrial mats, bone mats, lymph node metastasis. We have worked with different tumor models, subcutaneous model, autotopic model, primary xenograft model, carcinogenesis model, you know, metastasis model. We also work in many species. We work in the mouse. It was very fortunate in the lab, we actually have access to all these animal models. Uh, mouse, rat, hamster. Hamster is really cute and it's kind of sad. And rabbit and dog. And we actually work with pig. And the pig doesn't grow tumor, but we're actually using a pseudo tumor model for, to test that. I still don't understand why pig don't grow tumor. Maybe they don't last long. People already eat them. So. And we also work now working on the monkeys and uh, to try to go through the entire process. And I think Selena's here will tell you how cute the dog is. <laughs> so I'm going to use the rest of the time to show you some of the three clinical scenarios. Because it's very important to, to think how you, when you design nanomedicine, you have to, to have the experience and what's the best way to approach, to find the best match of the function together with application. Because the last thing as a chemist, a biomedical engineering, the mistakes they do is they find the nanoparticle can do different function. They're looking for applications. And that's actually a diff direct, it's not the right direction to go because that way it can, can be very misleading. You really need to work in the beginning with the clinicians to identify what's the unmet clinical need, then find what's the best function, the minimalized function you need to address this need. And that's how we actually should be the right way to do the translation, to find the nanoparticle for the clinical application. So I'm going to give you three examples. Hopefully, this is our experience can be shared and uh, to help everyone else working on the clinical nanomedicines. I think I have half an hour, right? Okay, good. So the first case scenario, I'm working, talking about is the prostate cancer. So prostate cancer, there is one of the, is getting better and better curative because of early and early diagnosis. Essentially majority of men has, you know, do live with prostate cancer. But the issue is you have so much screening of the PSA and you find that everyone find that, you know, if you, Basically, I had the last week I had the, uh, I have an uh, annual visit. The doctor asked me, "Do you want to PSA?" I said, "No." He said, "Why?" Because I don't want to know I have a prostate cancer. <laughs> it's better to not know it than knowing it and you live with it, right? So that's actually naturally, and that's a paradox because the more accurate you find these cancers, the more difficult choice you're facing. You either live with it. That's what the Canadians are do. They hope you everybody do active surveillance, like waiting, waiting, waiting because we don't have money, right? But if in the US, oh, take it out, because all the surgeons make tons of money. So that's why the US is favor radical prostatomy, and the Canadian, hopefully, you're just waiting, right? But there's hopefully there is some middle ground. 
The middle ground is this uh, focal therapy, just this, in a way is similar to like, uh, the, the breast cancers. If you take only a small portion of it, now you can live with it and you're without worrying too much about the cancer coming back. But the problem is, if you want ever have the third alternative strategy, you have to make sure, number one is maximum effective, number two is a maximum safety. Otherwise, you defeat all the purpose. Right? So that's really the essence of this try to working with this lower risk disease. There are still arguments, people say the biomarker discovery, if you can eliminate the chance of this find out which cancer patient will have a chance to grow, have a more metastatic than the other, then, then you probably will reduce the population you need to go through this headache, right? But still, I can give you one shocking statistics. Out of the active surveillance trial in Canada, 47% patient, percent patient dropped out within two years. Let's tell you, the man doesn't like concept of live with prostate cancer. I, I don't want to see hard waiting. So our cancer center, headed by Brian Wilson and John Trendenberg, start this work. In fact, the prostate cancer group on the focal therapy, they have done a lot of work before even the photothermal. They did it with the PDT with uh, Professor um, you know, Avril here. And they did it with the 2 cat trial, actually, we did it with the Canada. With the same concept, it's really the ideas. For the photothermal, they, what they did is they put in the patient in the magnet. The idea is, remember, the light can be precisely delivered. That's really the only point how they actually achieve this. They put the patient in a magnet. Every whole process is under the magnet, MI. So you need MI, you have to do the scan, then you actually do the pre- before you do the treatment, you have another MI scan to match him with the already you know, on file. Now you find a way to define this tumor. Then you almost like using the brachytherapy platform. So you insert the fiber under the MI guidance to the tumor. Now actually inside the tumor, and this is rectum wall, so basically you can show this. The light will be firing back from the other side to maximize, minimize the damage to the rectum wall. Now actually shine the light, you actually go in temperature increase, this is the most important point. MI has to be monitored by the temperature because without MI temperature monitoring, you really don't have a control of thermal. That's the difference between photodynamic and photothermal. Photodynamic is less damage, collateral damage, but you don't know you, the effect you have to monitor later. Photothermal, instantly you can see because above the 55 degree, you, you reach the point of no return, so you can know it's curing. So this is actually using MI thermometry and followed by MI scan. So this is where we, uh, my group, the Poffsons come in and say, you know, we should uh, really improve this because this process takes every file, take, takes five, like five, 10 watts I mean, of treatment, really huge, because you read it with 930 nanometer light with water. So this is a um, initial trial, it looks very good because there's no side effect, okay? Because old patient, clinicians are very cautious and not over-treat them. <laughs> but, there is a 20% you have to need a subsequent treatment, right? Yes. So you warm up the area up to what degree? So basically you heat it up to 60 degrees. 60 degrees. 60 degrees. Yeah. It's a thermal grading we drive. Yeah, but then this. you cannot control the, the uh, area that is very close to the nerve bundle. They actually did that. The only problem is they cannot over-treat them. That's why they stopped the treatment before the stop. Before exactly. The so, so it spread it. Hmm? It may spread beyond the fascia, beyond the capsule. Uh, they also had another effect, which is the rectum, because they have the, the heat sink effect. I know, yeah. yeah. So the point I want to make is this way, this way of doing without the targeting, without any kind of biological targeting effect, is precisely based on the, 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 how the light is delivered, have some limitations, because they cannot 100% ablate without the safety mind to say 100 cannot be completely left. That's why most of the case, there is, so far there is no side effect, but there is certain 20% of under treatment. Yes. So here's where the Poffson comes in. Because the first question is, can porphosone help the, improve the biologic effect? Can bring the dose down? The more importantly, how can they be more selective, more tumor selective in the prostate cancer? So to prove that, we were very easy to do this because we have a PET imaging, right? 
So what we're showing is in the prostate osteotopic prostate model, whether you are the 22RV1 or the PC3, we can show the, the, the tumor to the, uh, to the prostate tissue selectivity is quite high. The most important is this one, the tumor to rectum is four to one ratios. And the inject dose per gram is maintained at about a four to five percent inject dose per gram. So it was pretty good in terms of the uh, nanoparticle accumulation. On the contrast, the FDG doesn't do anything. And that's the reason why the PSMA becomes so popular because PSMA is very good. So we cannot beat PSMA in terms of tumor selective. Our goal is try to do in ablation to do everything else. So once we prove the porphyrosome's selectivity to the tumors, I can come back to it why they do that, and we actually applied it. So once we do that, we have to do, we want to make sure all the clinical protocol is being duplicated in the animals. So they do the patient on the MI, we do entire study, put the mice in on the MI. And using also topic prostate model, on the MI scanner, we insert the fiber under the MI guidance, just like a patient does. If you look carefully, you may see a, a fiber right here. The fiber obviously is way bigger, looks very big to the tumor because that's a mouse, right? And now you actually are following the MI thermometry, you can see the temperature improvement. As soon as reaching the temperature, we stop the treatment. So it's just like the protocol. And we actually follow by MI, see the tumors can entirely completely disappear, while the control one keep going. This is probably the most important thing, is we demonstrate the porphyrosome photothermal effect, but we don't see any damage to the rectum wall, whether you have compared all the controls. So this is actually give us a really good hope. We may actually generating uh, some selectivity, which help this uh, prostate uh, focal therapy. So Carl Fisher, I think he's not here, but uh, Selena is working with Carl on this, has been working on this. Uh, now we move that to a step further to the dog models. The dog has really nice os spontaneous osteotopic prostate model, but we can't afford that. It's Corrado asking us $50,000 per dog. We just can't can do that. So we have to do it in a different way. We inject the canine cell into the dog prostate to create the canine prostate model. And in the very beginning, initially, we actually can see the, the fluorescence and the photoacoustic is actually the, uh, so the endoscopy fluorescent imaging is actually corresponding very well with MI funding. So this is actually give us a real good model to do this prostate therapies. So the second case I want to explain, um, so that case basically, the message from that is, you, we didn't using, we're using the PET scan of the porphyrosome to do the pretreatment planning. And we do the focothermal therapy, right, for the photothermal therapy. We didn't use fluorescence, we didn't use uh, photodynamic, we didn't use anything else, right? Because that's why you only need exactly what you need to minimize them to do this therapy, because that's the way you can not least disrupt the clinical flow that's what we're looking for. So this is actually a very interesting um, study. Uh, it's called an endometrial cancer. Why we're interested in endometrial cancer? Because compared to the cervical cancer, even though endometrial is only right above the cervical, cervical is a perfect for the case for sentinel lymph node mapping. Because if you inject close to that, everything was draining to the 100% dojunal lymph node, so the ICG works extremely well for the cervical cancer. Endometrial cancer is a different scenario. Because if you inject into the endometrial, the agent, ICG, it has a two drainage pathway. 85% drainage to the, what you think about it, a 15% drainage upwards. So if you're doing the central lymph node mapping, you immediately you're missing 15%. But even though, because of that, if people are still working on it because there is no other method to do it. Right now, the endometrial cancer was so barbaric, the way to do the diagnosis is by taking out all the lymph node, right? Lymph, complete lymphodectomy around the area for the purpose of diagnosis not even for the curative treatment. I mean, I can't believe at the, this age where people are still doing that. This is only in the, in the stage two, they do complete uh, diagnosis. So then they actually decide what to do, chemo, radiation, doing all the things. So the idea is, if we have an agent can help to identify all the positive nodes, right? You can allow for false positive, but as long as you don't miss anything, 
Now, actually, you can find a chance to decrease the number of nodes to taking out. That's really uh, survival. That's really therapeutic benefit. Right? If you can improve efficacy, even better. So that's our ideas. So I have a brilliant student, Lauren, who is a re medical surgical, surgical resident and uh, you know, joined my lab as a graduate student. And now she's going to MGH as a fellow. So what she did is there was endometrial, there was very few endometrial model available. There are only two endometrial cell lines. Only two cell lines available in the literature. And that doesn't grow very well. So she said, why don't we do the endometrial cancer in the, in the, in the rabbit? Because rabbit allow me to do all the surgical techniques. So this is what she did. She did it in different models. She actually put in the VX2 tumor in the endometrial. As VX2 goes, rabbit always grow the tumor. But what she did differently is she actually also creating a cell lines from the VX2, grown cell line, then put the cell line with luciferase, then find a way to put them back. Now we actually have a way to do a cell line model with VX2. So what it does is this, when she had this nice model, she had about 75% success rate. I'm, I'm not sure if you have another student do it, it will be still 75%, really, the surgical skill the student come to infect. And what's interesting is 800% metastatic transformation in the lymph node. So that gives us a really good chance. So I'm going to show you just a very few examples. This is the, uh, the clinical scanner, which is modified for the professor wavelengths. You can see the primary uterine tumor can be easily identified by the fluorescence, as well as the pseudo color. This is the bright field. This is fluorescence. This is pseudo color. Some surgeon prefer green. Some surgeon likes to see the, exactly the original black and white. So if you look at this one, this is the omentum metastasis, about one millimeter size in omentum. It can be easily missed by the fatty tissue and their metastatic nodes, right? And this can, uh, in a way, is very intriguing because most of the tumor, we, if we consider tumor targeting is really by EPR of nanoparticle, how can they get into this metastatic lymph node? And this, not, not lymph node, omentum metastasis. So this is actually, uh, this is actually showing the actual fluorescence guide surgical resection. This is a tumor. After resection, you can see keep seeing the residual tumor and the followed by residual tumor. Now you actually can do, Lauren can do the surgical excision, then see actually make the surgical bed cleaning better. And this is actually leading to complete different staging protocol, including ultra staging. And what she was observing, I think this is probably the most important point, is you have pretty overall speaking, you have very good sensitivity at least compared to current technology. Uterine tumor is like obviously, but that's the least clinical relevant. Lymph node metastasis, you have 100% sensitivity. Only specificity, there are 66% because there is a lot of false positives. But that's okay because we were looking for the, we don't want any false negative, right? So we want to make sure everything was the, was the disease is contained. And abdominal metastasis, this is the probably the unexpected finding we see such a high sensitivity specificity for this augmented metastasis. And that's actually uh, we were looking into it. We haven't found a clinical thinking scenario for that yet. So I want to use the final example to give you the, the, the lung cancer case, because this is what we think is probably the mo will be very first clinical application for porphosomes. And I, explained, I could explain to you why. So for the lung cancer, Especially for this, the PDT is well known using for lung cancer, most for central airways. But for this peripheral lesion, especially we're talking about the bronchial, behind the bronchial wall. These area, there is actually no method currently clinical proved. Radiation therapy, stereoscopy radiation therapy has been clinical trial doing that. Essentially, it's transcutaneously doing radiation therapy, right? But there is no approved therapy for that yet. There is a lot of trials. So the reason why this is important, because usually don't, people don't see these tumors. But because of the lung cancer screening, the spiral CT, everything, they find so much nodules in the lung. Just like prostate case, there are so much nodules. And they actually improve the benefit a lot. But the key thing is so much nodule, what do you do with it? Especially if you have a heavy smoker, you cannot just take a piece of lung out, take another piece of it. They have bad lung. You, you couldn't even treat them. The lot of eight, old age group, you cannot survive the surgery. So that's a lot of problem. But the, you know, what's fortunately, there is a lot of bronchoscope detection technique has been actually uh, has been 
tremendously being used. This is one of them called endobronchial, ultrasound guided. Uh, this is actually by my friend, Kazuyo Sufuku. So this basically said, in the tip of the bronchoscope, they add ultrasound. Now using ultrasound to find where the tumor is, hopefully behind the bronchial wall, now what you do, now you stick the fiber into it to do a biopsy. That's what currently they're doing. This is how the, you see the fiber go into the lung, then they pick up the pick up things. So that's how they do the biopsies. And despite this effort, out of all the bronchoscope study, meta-analysis shows 3,000 patients only diagnosed yield is 70%. And that's still low, because if you look at the lesion effect diagnosed yield, less than two, two centimeter tumor, 61% only. Only when you have a, this is the only come with a larger than two centimeter tumors. You have to imagine the two centimeter in lung, you know, it's, uh, it's, this is not really good. So what we want is, the clinical need is, we need to find a way during the bronchoscope to make the diagnosis better. We need to find a way to actually detection better, to actually guiding the surgery, even more important to guide the treatment. So this is where we come up with. We want to do the study in a rabbit because a rabbit is about four kilogram, it's just like a baby. And why we do that? Because pediatric bronchoscope is the smallest bronchoscope you can get. That's how we actually can do it in the babies. So if you do the rabbit, we first of all doing the inoculating the tumor in the lung, and we want to make sure the tumor is growing behind the wall. So you can see this pathology, you can show them. And the idea is once you find this tumor out of this branch, now you stick the fiber, now you ablaze them. Doing the same, avoid all the biopsy, doing actually find them. If you think suspicious, treat them right away. So that's the idea. So this is easy said than done. This paper takes us six years to complete. And the, but multiple students go through this process. Essentially, this is also multiple group work is from the lung sclerotic surgeon, Kazu Yasufuku, and the Brian Wilson's group. And this is a Patrick McVeigh's bronchoscope, an MD-PhD student make this bronchoscope allow for the laser to, do, to, to get into the really channel. And this is showing that deep in the lung, in the bronchial, you don't see anything after 45 minutes of injection. Sorry. Yeah. This is, a, if you tune your eye, you will see the tumor here, and here there's two tumor shining behind the wall, right? And that's very exciting, the deep behind the wall because the clinicians are blinded. If you see where the tumor is, now you can insert the fiber. You can also appreciate why people think about this, why it's moving so much, because rabbit is breathing two times faster than a human, right? So it's really underscore, you really need to see it before you ablate it. And once we do that, and we see the ablation, and we see the selectivity. And this is how we actually complete the study. But the, there is a lot of question about the study. The first question is, is it biological relevant? Because we, again, we're using VX2, and rabbit has only one tumor, that's VX2. So we did that with, uh, with this Japanese, we have a lot of Japanese surgeons doing the fellowship in our lab. We actually can see the very smart surgeon, they actually can do the oral garage instead of open it, do a surgery to see the tumor in the lung. They do the oral garage, and it to the, it basically under the scope, you can insert a fiber, uh, insert a tumor, inject a tumor right there, let them grow. We tried a different kind of lung cancer, H549, H460, H520, all maintain certain level of selectivity. So the biologically is relevant. The next step is clinical relevant. We have to pick the pig, because that's where the pig lung is most similar to the human lung. So in that case, but I have mentioned, pig doesn't grow tumors. So we want to do as much as we can by getting the mouse tumor, let the porphyrin injection, let them naturally accumulate in the tumor in the mouse. Now they take out the tumor. Now you see the tumor into different location of the lung. That's as bad as we can get, really, as best as we can get. So this is how we did, sit in different place. And allow this study, we were able to show we can do uh, fluorescence. We can do the fluorescence guide biopsy. We can actually do the fluorescence, uh, can do actually the thermal ablation in the ex vivo lung. So the one I want to need to mention is TGH, our, you know, our hospital has one of the best lung transplant program. So they can put outside the lung, cultivate it, 
keep it for about two days, and they can actually do all the treatment with the lung, then put it back to the patient. In fact, some of our Brian Wilson students are working with the lung transplant group, try to do the PDT of this uh, killing all the bacteria virus and put it back in the lung, right? So that's the idea. But for us, this is offer a really nice uh, model to do the study in the pig. This is the one, my final slide I want to show you. It's how important the physics play the role in the PDT or in all the nanotechnology and in the imaging and information. As I mentioned to you, you have this bronchoscope go there. But the broncos don't go very far. Normally, the broncos go to only this branch. Then what do you do? What if the tumor behind? Right? And because the fiber is too big to get there, the broncos is too big. But now with our uh, you know, Japanese collaborators, I know we finished that, the last one, we have a 0 0.97 millimeter fiber. This one millimeter fiber has a two channel. You can allow both ablation the treatment and imaging. And that will change the entire scenario we do with this one. Because in couple this with robotic bronchoscope, then we really think there's a clinical potential there. So we're now in the final step of this uh, translation process. We're now doing the monkeys studies. And we actually develop a radioisotope kit for the GMP. And this is a, really the message I want to teach in this lecture. The simpler, the better. It's a key simple, right? Clinical scenario dictates function, not technology looking for application. Remember that. And finally, always think about companion technology to make friends with physicists in anywhere you go, because they are the ones who are solving all the problems for the hardware. And um, I have to acknowledge all my uh, uh, students. We are really a fun bunch, and uh, this is the famous Toronto gangsters. And uh, these are all my uh, collaborators, especially all the surgeons. And uh, I'm sure everybody know Brian Wilson's here. So I got five minutes. <laughs> questions from students? Yes, please. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, when you showed the differentiation between PTT and photodynamic therapy, and you said that that difference could be seen under hypoxia or the excess of, or the normoxia or hyperoxemia. Um, so I was wondering, is it possible that just the photosensitizer by itself when it is activated can trigger photodynamic uh, therapeutic effect by interacting with the biomolecules, which is some of the literature says that it's a type 3 reaction, and that cannot be, um, what's, what's the amount of uh, contribution from that type 3 kind of a reaction? So I can't answer the type 3 reaction because I think that's a still a topic for discuss. But what I, I think you, want, you mentioned one important word, amount. Essentially, what I see in this porphyrin structures, we are talking about amount. When you think about it, when you actually inject a porphyrin molecule, the circulating in the blood, how many molecules get into the tumors? The delivery efficiency is not very high. So the potency is a lot of them are limited by that. Because once the porphyrin generates syngloxin, nothing stops it. Right? But all the nanoparticles you give them, a lot of them stuck in the liver, spring, I will go come back to this lecture three about that. What the porphyrin does differently, it is a combination of the porphyrin molecule and the nanoparticle behavior to allow them to locally in so much enrichment of the molecule, porphyrin molecule inside the tumor area that allow for the almost like a gradient effect to get them so much more into the cancer cell. So I believe the reason why they are so potent in terms of both in the PDT and the photodynamic is because of the amount of the porphyrin it delivers. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. It's uh, actually, I think, the EPR effect that get the large particles. The larger is the particle, the more it will get into the tumor. So it's not just the amount of molecules, but the EPR effect works there very well, and that's the. Uh, um, 
we saw it a long time ago with the serum albumin complex and so forth. So this is about the size of it. And I think the trend of the porphyrins like the bacterioclovids and the other to self-organize is important. One question that I have to you, uh, the copper uh, will lead to trip doublet annihilation of the energy uh, very fast. When you put the copper in the porphyrins, you will have no fluorescence because of the trip doublet transitions. So um, one important part of having VTP with or PDT with the particles that you have is actually to get rid of yes. the copper molecules as soon as possible once they get into the target. So the biological environment is enough to spread the molecules around, to get them dissociate from each other. Because otherwise you will, uh, that's why you get the heat effect, because yes. of the trip duplet yes. transition. That's a, that's a beautiful question. And uh, the reason we focus on the porphyrin clinical translation on the photothermal effect is exactly because of that. Because the thermal gradients, you don't need with them getting the cancer cell to work. But we have a different version. I will have the ne le my next lecture. Different version of the porphyrin nanostructure try to exactly to amplify the cellular uptake to improve the PDT effect, to tuning the bad equation to the other side. And in terms of EPR, yes, that's my lecture three. <laughs> you can have similar effect with nickel, by the way. Mm -hmm. The nickel will, the nickel, Yes. Uh, and we tried it. I mean, the nickel will also give you... Uh, no, the because the reason is we only... The copper 64 is such a tiny portion of the porphyrin structures. Okay. So that even you have a nickel, you have zinc, and after... The no, no, I'm talking about the trip doublet effect. You will not have it with the zinc. You have it with the nickel. You have it with the copper. And then the translation to heat is, is immediate. Even if you have... You know, like the uh, antennas in yeah. the, uh, in the um, uh, green plants or in the... I, I think we can discuss about that. We have a lot of uh, questions on that. So for those of you who want to, you know, more questions, we have two more lectures, and the last lecture I'll reserve quite a long time, you know, 20 minutes something for the discussion. So keep it. Thank you. <laughs>